awful lot of time left for this man to do mischief. And mischief is what he is all about. He will not rest until America is broken, until every avenue of protest is snuffed out. This man is behind it all as sure as I'm sitting here. You say, well, how can you prove that? Well, you put two and two together. Al Sharpton is Barack Obama in a jumpsuit. Al Sharpton is Barack Obama without the smoothness. That's why he took that street thug in and out of the White House secretly a hundred times over the last few years to tell him exactly what to say that he himself could not say. This is how it works. He was sent out to make sure there was a war on police, in my opinion. Then there's Holder, now enjoying a multi-million dollar lifestyle as a lawyer. After wrecking America's peace and harmony, he went back to a law firm. Then there's de Blasio, still ruining New York. Then there's Louis Farrakhan, who asked openly a week ago for men to go out and kill police. He said it. Not one word from the White House at the time. My friends, you're in the middle of a civil war. It was started when this communist street agitator was sworn in, and it's only just begun. Not since the run-up to the civil war have we as a country been more divided. The battle lines have been drawn, and Barack Obama is the general of the opposition to our way of life. That's my opinion. Where is the media? Where is the Republican Party on the execution of a white cop filling a gas tank in Texas, executed by a black criminal, cowardly walked up behind him, shot him in the back of the head, and then emptied his gun 15 shots as he lay on the ground. 15 shots. Obama started this war on police through his dangerous anti-police rhetoric. This maniac has to be impeached for treason. He must be impeached. Of course, we will not get the votes required, but it will start the national dialogue, and he will be exposed for what he really is. That's my opinion. I think you are all as upset as I am about the so-called Black Lives Matter phonies. This is an anti-white, anti-cop organization who, if they are not called out for who they are, calling for frying pigs in a blanket, etc., more cops will die. And eventually there will be a reaction that you do not want in this country. On a district of southern Damascus, in which they conquered parts of the district, and brought ISIS forces close to the Syrian capital, is expected to accelerate the Russian military intervention. They're not going to let Assad fall, no matter what Obama does, to facilitate his fall. They said this is a red line that cannot be crossed. And by the way, if Russia intervenes militarily in this way, Russia will be the first country from outside the Middle East to send ground forces into the Syrian civil war. Very big development, enormous development, very big development. Now, here's what's even more interesting. Here is what's even more interesting. On August 18th, six of Russia's advanced MiG-31 Foxhound interceptor aircraft landed at the Syrian Air Force's Mezi Air Base, which is the military section of Damascus International Airport. And right after the Russian fighters landed, they were immediately followed by giant Russian Antonov AN-124 Condor cargo planes carrying 1,000 of Russia's S-9M-133 Cornet anti-tank missiles, 1,000 of the most advanced anti-tank missiles that Russia has. Number two, before the Russian jets landed in Damascus, Moscow reached an agreement with Washington, with Washington for the removal of NATO's Patriot missile batteries from Turkey. Now, why would that be done? <clears throat> why would Moscow insist that Obama remove NATO Patriot missiles in Turkey? Because they were afraid that Turkey could fire the missiles at Russian fighters carrying out operations in Syrian airspace. This is a big, big story, and it's going to develop over the next week. Very big story to put ground troops, jet aircraft, anti-tank missiles to support Assad who, in my opinion, Obama is trying to overthrow by permitting ISIS to run wild across the Middle East. Now, on the face of it, what's interesting here is that the U.S. is cooperating with Russia by removing the, well, encouraging NATO to remove the Patriot missiles, okay? But which side is Washington really on? Is it on the side of ISIS or on the side of Assad? That's the only question there is with regard to this humanitarian nightmare 
that has emerged because of Obama's meddling and the Arab Spring ignited by none other than Hillary email Clinton. Never forget, those emails contain info on the Arab Spring, which has blown up the world. Another topic I want to talk about is a dumb basketball dribbler by the name of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, whose real name is Lou Al-Sindar, who became a black Muslim at some point in his, in his evolution. This dumb basketball dribbler is suddenly an expert on the news. He became Einstein. After th spending his whole life throwing balls around on a wooden floor and aiming for hoops, he is now a political scientist. He attacked Trump, and he called Trump an enemy of the Constitution, and he called Bernie Sanders uh, a wonderful shot man. Now, what's interesting here is that this Einstein fears an American nationalist like Trump, but supports a weakling anti-American socialist like Sanders, as you would expect. Do I need to say any more? Iran devils get their deal, says the Daily News. The die is cast, they write, President Oh, shameful! will ram his Iranian nuclear deal through Congress despite majority opposition in both the House and Senate. Now what? Worry a lot, they write. Although the fight is lost, the Senate owes the people an up or down vote on one of the most consequential foreign policy agreements in decades. Obama says he has boxed the Iranians so tightly that they have no chance of expanding a greatly reduced nuclear program in the short run, and that he or a future president could snap back economic sanctions should the Iranians go rogue. Thus, he argues, America will be better positioned to curb Iran for the 15-year life of the pact. They write that his positions are based on faith and hope, two virtues that are misplaced when risking utter catastrophe, quite probably triggering an arms race in the Middle East and leaving Israel under the shadow of a mushroom cloud. At the same time, the terror-exporting radical Islamist regime in Iran will gain economic strength, becoming still more capable of waging not-so-covert warfare in the Middle East. I can pause right there because it's the, the, the limit of your attention span. The article is quite much longer, but I know the attention span of a, of, a, of a pigeon is the average attention span of a radio listener, especially days before Labor Day weekend, when we have so many more important things to do. Car rides, barbecues. I don't know what else we're going to do. I'm, I'm going away. I'm going somewhere. I don't want to sit here and cook a hot dog by myself on a barbecue grill, just me and the dog. <laughs> the fact is that Obama is... A liar he's a serial liar he has lied to US citizens without apology he has stepped on the Constitution he has destroyed race relations he has attacked Republicans telling Hispanics to punish them he has abandoned our allies he has appeased tyrants he is coddling adversaries he is using the Crusades as an excuse for inaction as Islamist terrorists slaughter their way and rape their way across the Middle East and now Obama has finally put the knife in our only real ally and the sole representative of Western civilization in the Middle East, a little nation called Israel. Just look at how he has sat on his hands while ISIS has been taking over the Middle East. Look how he's thrown away all of the dead boys who died in Iraq and Afghanistan, all the gains thrown in the toilet. Look how he has crippled our military. Look how he has crippled our foreign policy. Look how he has weakened our economy by printing money. You think the economy is doing well? Are you sure? Your health insurance will be up hundreds of dollars a month. Hundreds of dollars a month. Yes, indeed. I guess Obama will soon socialize car insurance and tell you that it's car care coming next. Everything he touches goes up in smoke. The question is, why is America asleep? Why? Why are Islamist extremists being coddled? Why is Islam being imported into the United States? Why? Because he promised to fundamentally transform America. And he is in the process of altering not only America, but the entire planet to his perverse vision of rule by a Stone Age totalitarian theocracy. As I said, if I were a psychiatrist, I would tell you that this diagnosis is critical. He is a psychopath by any definition. But since most Americans don't know the difference between psychopathology 
and their own pathologies. There's no point in talking about it. So anyway, look, it's Thursday, it's Labor Day weekend. What do you care about Iran, a nuclear bomb? What's it? And what do you care if Israel disappears? Big deal. Just a bunch of greedy Jews. Let them, let them pack their valises and move to Los Angeles, right? What do you care if Obama floods America with Muslim? What do you care if the churches become mosques? I mean, it was done in Turkey, where the great, greatest cathedral in the world became a mosque. So what's the difference? What do you care about anything? What do you care if America becomes like Mexico, a totalitarian, totalitarian third world banana republic run by narco terrorists? What do you care? What do you care? Just keep driving your car. Hey, look at the new cars out there. Look at the colors of the shirts you can buy. Go on a cruise, too. <laughs> Take a nice cruise as a result of your wonderful work all your life. Throwing away the legacy that you inherited. What do you care about any of it for? Isn't that the new modality of America? Care about nothing? Isn't that the mark of the intelligent man and woman to care about nothing? Is that not the mark of the atheist? There's no God. There's no judgment. Weren't you told for 40 years by the radical lesbian feminists not to be judgmental? Sure. So now that you're not judgmental, they're throwing Christians in jail and won't uh, grant marriage licenses. They're pretty judgmental. You're not supposed to be judgmental, but the radical lesbian feminists are quite judgmental, aren't they? How'd that happen? How did it happen? Because you don't see things for what they are. It's called sleight of hand. The problem for them is that there's some of us out here, and a lot of us, who can see the sleight of hand. And it's not so slight. So what's the hope? A lot of hope. Yeah, right. A lot of hope. A lot of hope. Now, Trump signs the loyalty oath with Prebius, that milk toast of the Republican Party. And I don't like it. I don't know what that really means. It seems like a peace treaty between the uh, old line Republican gangsters and Donald saying, look, we won't attack you if you agree that if you're not nominated by our gang, you will not turn against us and run as a third party candidate. As they sort of neutralized each other. It's a little worrisome. It's a, the previous is about the perfect man to be the stooge of Obama. There's no, no two-party system. It's a one-party system. I'll be right back. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. I was watching a documentary on India and the economy of India. And you may have read this years ago, The Elephant That Became a Tiger, India. Now, we know India was booming. It's a little slow now. But I was fascinated to see how poverty went down and literacy went up in two decades and how the, the cities of India boomed and I didn't understand what had happened till I watched this documentary. Here's what happened. After the British left India, and I think it was 1947, as a result of the nonviolent Mahatma Gandhi, the guy with the diaper and the cane, the wood stick. I'm just giving you a caricature. Gandhi, the guy with the diaper and the wood stick. He used nonviolence to drive the British out. So everyone cheered, yay, nonviolence works. Well, one of the first things that happens was the Muslims rioted, wanted all of India. The Hindus fought back. There was a war. So the peaceful man in the diaper made a decision, and he decided to carve out a new nation for the Muslims. And on the march to the Muslim nation, a million people died. Hindu and Muslim killed each other. That's a little side effect of uh, the separation. So then the Muslims got their own nation, and they still weren't, ha weren't happy. Now, they're still trying to take India apart. But let's put that aside for a minute, just for a minute. What actually freed the Indian economy? So right after the British leave, what they leave in place, they left a gigantic bureaucracy. The British were great bureaucrats. They were fabulous government workers. They created great government in infrastructure. That was a fundamentally socialist infrastructure. And the Indians inherited it. So people said, wow, now that the British are gone, we're going to do something new. Well, guess what happened? The minute Indians took over the roles of the British, they not only didn't get rid of the infrastructure where the government ruled everything, they expanded it. They expanded the socialist infrastructure that the British had left them, and they became even more dictatorial, and things froze. 
poverty increased after the British left.